half in the bag. I love to watch movies in my underwear. Well, it's been a week or two since we were transported back in time and Plinkett's house put back in its proper place by aliens who gave us a very important mission, which for the life of me, I can't remember what it was. It must not have been too important then. No, I mean, aliens intervene in human history every so often, you know. The building of the Great Pyramids, uh, and then now. When? Oh, when they transported us back in time to do something. Oh, I forgot that part too. I think, Jay, it may have been for us to watch movies and review them. Why would we do that? That sounds like a horrible waste of time. But anyways, <laughs> I saw several films recently. Two, to be exact. Did you also <laughs> perhaps see the same two films I did? I don't know, what two films did you see? 10 Cloverfield Street. Nightmare on Cloverfield Street, whatever the <laughs> hell it was called, and me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. No, me, me, myself, and Irene. Me, him, and her. A film by the venerable Max Landis. 10 Cloverfield Lane stars John Goodman as Harry, I, I mean uh, Howard, and Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Nadine, I, I mean Michelle. And then some other guys also there. While it doesn't seem to be a sequel to Cloverfield, it does borrow its name for marketing purposes. Mike, what did you think of 10 Cloverfield Lane? I loved this film, Jay. It was very good. I hadn't heard about it until the minute before I saw it. That's, that's the case with everybody. They made this movie completely in secret. Nobody knew it existed until like a month ago. Uh, yeah, and that, that, I mean, there was kind of like the marketing angle with the, the first Cloverfield movie. It was very like cryptic, like, what is it? What is yeah. it? And then I was like, oh, it's a Godzilla knockoff. Well, that's the thing. It's like there was all sorts of viral marketing and Easter eggs and viral ad campaign and, oh, slush -o means something. And it was like piecing it all together. And then you go see the movie and it's just a Godzilla movie. And this was... Uh, this had the counter effect of zero marketing. <laughs> Other than the title. Other than it kind of reminded me of uh, like the Stephen King books, how they're always in Castle Rock, Maine, right? Mm -hmm. Is that where it's like just like a thread or a, a theme or not even a theme, just something that ties them together. Right. It, It'll take place in this small town in Maine. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, like what John Carpenter was trying to do with the Halloween series. After the first two, Halloween 3 was supposed to be its own separate thing, and then it was going to be just an anthology series yeah. loosely connected by the season of Halloween. Mm. Only this one's loosely connected by the name Cloverfields. That, so they're even less connected. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some little Easter eggs in this. There's something that tie it in. Yeah. But as a general movie-going audience, it, it, yeah. they're completely separate movies that have nothing to do with each other. The only Easter egg I saw was the the gas station was the Kelvin, which was uh, in Cloverfield as well as Star Trek. The USS Kelvin was the mm. first. That's the J.J. Abrams bad robot thing. Yeah. Somehow somebody knows about this. And Slusho was on. They were advertising that at the gas station, which is yeah. like a brand, their own brand of slushies, I guess. I don't know. It, it, I don't follow this crap. The point is, all that aside, the movie's a good movie about a girl who. Is driving, crashes a car, and wakes up chained uh, in, in a guy's uh, doomsday shelter. Mm -hmm. He was very much like uh, Harry S. Plinkett. Uh, I, I don't know, someone I heard of, a big, big, fat, so weirdo that. that oh, is he that guy whose videos keep getting copyright claims? We discover that there may or may not have been some kind of incident outside a nuclear attack, a alien invasion, a biological attack, who knows, but uh, that's the thing is like is this guy really just a nutso or did something really happen and then our, our hero is this girl and there's another guy in there with her and um, some drama plays out. It's a very, very small movie Yes. in terms of uh, scope. Which is, which is what I loved about it. But I very big in terms of drama. I was in the middle of a thought. Oh my god. Some 
how do you feel about the fact that it is called Clover Fields? Like, is this, because I know the movie was conceived and shot as a separate thing, and then they added Cloverfield later, and I think there were some pickup shoots. Like, um, like, cause, like the, the mailbox? On the yeah, I think that was like an, a later edition, because it, it, is it uh, just cynical marketing to try and get people to see this movie that maybe they wouldn't otherwise see, or is it a subversion to get people that are used to these big overblown movies to see such a small scale because this feels like a like a smaller independent like like VOD type movie yeah, like that hidden I, which we had mentioned before the movie the hidden and it's similar it reminded me of that hidden this like forget your uh, Captain America Civil Wars and your X-Men Apocalypse Bob shelters are where it's at Hollywood <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know, Jay. I don't know. I, I can say I saw this movie. I didn't even see a trailer. I knew John Goodman was, was in it. John Goodman was a mean guy in a basement. That's all I knew. Mm. All I knew. And it was called Cloverfield, which I guess you're right because it perked my ears up. Is this going to have a sci-fi monster angle to it? Something about that. Oh, okay. Oh my God, it has a what, 95% Rotten Tomato score. Everybody seems to like this. I'll go check it out. Uh, I, I don't know what the answer is because I don't know what their intentions are, but I know just, I mean, I think it's a great movie, but I know if they released it called, I think the original title was like The Cellar. If you just put this movie out, The Cellar, nobody would have seen it. Nobody would have seen those movies. That's true. It Uh, even though I think the trailer was great, I, I like this type of story, this sort of, what do they call it, like a bottled story where it's all in one uh, closed location, really claustrophobic, really well executed too, and acted, like everything about this movie is great. But without that connection to, oh, that's something that I know, mm -hmm. it might not have stood a chance. And maybe that was J.J. Abrams, or whoever had the idea that was their thinking, is like, this is a great movie, but no one's gonna see it. So let's, you know, do this, get it out there. And it, it feels like a movie from another era, like until towards the end, which I, I keep getting to that. Yes. But. Well, let's stop now because let's say from frame one to 95%, the movie is great. So spoilers from here on out, skip to this time code to get past this review or to hear the end of it or wherever you want to go. Um, I'm sure you're dying to hear what we thought of me, him, her. So skip to this time code to check that out, but. Or just close the video and skip over to some, some YouTube uh, three minute trailer reaction. Yes, I hear they saw Spider-Man in the end of the new Captain America Civil War video. Oh my God, did you see that? Did you I notice that? I saw it, and see the way he shot his web out. That did you see when he's flipping, when he, you can see his back and he's got the spider symbol on his back? That's a so circa 1970. I'm going to keep you alive. You were in an accident, and I saved your life by bringing you here. And everyone outside of here is dead. What was great about it was he he uh, pulled off like a legit weirdo, without being Randy Quaid from uh, in. Uh, Oh, yeah. 2012, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna leave Fallout Shelter and the aliens are like... Not you know, Randy that. Quaid. In 2012, it was Woody, Woody Harrelson, right? Whatever, yeah. Independence Day, it was Randy Quaid. The same character in all those yes. stupid role yes. in movies. When, when you go with the, 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 the isolated redneck in flyover country yeah. who's scared of the government, who's scared of aliens, who has a Fallout Shelter, they're always like stock character. But John Goodman just seemed like a disturbed person. He, and, and he seems was, to believe what he's saying, and he also, he's the best kind of villain where he doesn't know he's a villain. What happened to your arm? Were you trying to escape? I was trying to get in. What was that? Quiet. How do you know that this is real? She escapes, uh, there's a big dumb action scene that goes on forever that reminds you of what movies are like nowadays that this movie avoided up until that point. Uh, but then she's, she's driving away in her car and she hears on the radio, uh, there's like a, a, a ramp to go to Houston. She's heading straight, but on the radio it's like, we need help, we really need people to come help us out in Houston. Mm -hmm. And she makes the decision to back up and go to Houston, mm -hmm. which is a nice little arc from the beginning of the movie, which is her running away from her problems without dealing with them. So it's like, that works. 
We didn't need to see her throw a Molotov cocktail into the mouth of a organic alien mech creature thing to get there. Um, so that's the part that I had problems with. Yeah, well the whole movie you're wondering uh, what, what actually happened outside. Is John Goodman crazy or did a real uh, uh, biological alien, some kind of attack happen? At one point we see a lady come up to the window of the shelter and she's clearly burned or has some kind of disease. Let me in, let me in, you know. Something happens to his pigs, we see the pigs are dead. So we know something might have happened, but we don't know what. Right. Finally, she gets outside after building her own, um, like, biological suit, mm -hmm. um, hazmat suit, uh, a chemical suit out of uh, a shower curtain, yes. duct tape and plastic bottles. It's uh, pretty clever. Wasn't it nice to see a movie that was clever? I was thinking about that. Like, yeah. they established early in the movie that she has some experience. She wants to be a fashion designer, mm -hmm. so she understands sewing, and that mm -hmm. comes into play. Mm -hmm. All these things that are set up that have a payoff. That it's uh, wonderful. Yeah, lots of things had uh, uh, were well paid off. It was a good script up until the very end. And so she gets out. Uh, she's running around uh, trying to get a car started. And then we hear this weird humming noise. We look up, she climbs on top of the pickup truck, and then she sees what's clearly an alien spaceship kind of hovering around at a distance, and she goes, oh, great, or, or something like that. She's like, like oh, that. come on. She, oh, come on. Like, hard cut to, cut to credits. I was thinking the exact same thing. And I'm like, that's great. I would have I stood up and, yeah. and applauded, because like you said, the story was over once she got out. Yeah. And, and then that's when you hear the little producers going, well, you, know, you can't end a movie on that. Is it yeah. So then it comes, a, a, there's a big thing with an anus mouth that's rah, hiding in the shed, getting out of the shed, running in the car, and the alien, and the, ah, we gotta give people them popcorn money yeah. worth the blood. And then um, uh, aliens are spraying around this orange chemical, which is kind of like what I assume is a pesticide for humans. And uh, it's established that there's some fires burning. It's established when the pesticide hits fire, it explodes. Mm -hmm. So then she has a bottle of booze and a magazine. Which is the both set up. Set up in the beginning, yeah. which were probably your reshoots. Could yeah, sure, uh, sure, put that bottle of booze so we know. <laughs> she can make a Molotov cocktail while she's being lifted into the air by an alien spaceship and light it and throw it. Um, my eyes rolled so far back into my head. I, <laughs> it was I had an injury, yeah, yeah, yeah. a brain injury. Mm. Disappointing, but it's one of those movies where it's like, okay, great movie, but they added this crap at the end for dummies, and yeah. you can just kind of like dismiss that. Right. <laughs> Something's coming. It was just like, we have to end this on a big explosion. And maybe that stuff wasn't reshoots, who knows? I, I don't know what was reshoots. Maybe yeah. it could have just been the insert of the uh, the mailbox and the, the slusho gas station. I have no idea. Yeah, and and as a straight up, like say she, she got out and we discover that the lady that ran up to the door was an escaped mental patient who had burned herself on the way out of a mental hospital. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with the world. I still would have been very satisfied. Well, the point was her to get out. The yeah. point was the, the interaction between the three characters in the basement. And either way, once she gets out, movie's over for me. I uh, loved it. Well, that's it for spoilers. Um, great movie. Great performances, great uh, really slow ratcheting up of tension in yes. almost every scene. Yes, so don't, don't go into this uh, expecting Cloverfield 2 with great scenes of destruction. I saw one thing on IMDb, it said, why, why, why was this on IMAX? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's a fair point. Once it feels like the story should be over, you can just leave, you're fine. And, uh, and that's when she climbs out of the fallout shelter. <laughs> Spoilers! <laughs> well, we told you she climbs out. She just climbs out and finds the anus alien. <laughs> the butthole creature. They were all butthole creatures, weren't they? There was the big ship. It was like organic and uh, uh, mechanical, and it had a big anus thing. Mm -hmm. There's the little thing running around. That was just a big anus thing. 
What is J.J. Abrams' obsession with anuses? The whole film was a metaphor because she was running away from her boyfriend because he wanted her to have anal sex. Oh! So it was like a big nightmare. She okay. just woke up from it. Okay. And her boyfriend on the phone was played by Bradley Cooper. I don't know why. He just did a voice voiceover part. Is his name on the poster? Wouldn't that be horrible? Bradley Cooper starring... Bradley Cooper in the new Cloverfield sequel! What? Fear of butt sex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready to take that step. What, you're breaking up? Ah! <laughs> Something's coming. Something's coming. Well, speaking of giant anuses, let's talk about a film that has a giant penis in it. I'm talking about Max Landis's cameo in his film Me, Him, Her. Oh, but I thought you were talking about the fact that there is a giant penis in the movie, too. Oh, the big puppet. Yeah. Oh my god, I totally forgot about that. There are stakes here, Brenda. It needs to be a secret or a career move, and we're thinking at this point it should be a secret. Secret. From acclaimed writer-director Max Landis comes a film called Me, Him, and Her, or Me, Him, Her. Shot in 2013, shelved, and then released on VOD this past Friday, Me, Him, Her is about the shocking truth of gay people in Hollywood. Life, love, lesbians, sword fights, shouting, and awkward extras propel this comedy into space! All this critic can say is, more Scott Bakula! Well, Jay, what did you think of me, him, her? <laughs> You're on camera. <laughs> well, Mike, uh, uh, this movie was ripped right out of 1997. And I don't mean that uh, in a good way. This felt like a movie from the mid-90s. I would say, and, and uh, I guess I should say... A lot of good movies were made in the mid-90s, Jay. There were, but there was also a, an entire subgenre of movies that... I, I hated the 90s, and I hated these types of movies, which is the, the young 20-somethings with minor relationship problems that absolutely nobody could possibly care about but them. Uh, I hated Reality Bites. I hated, like... Uh, Empire Records, like all those type of movies, and that's what this reminded me of a lot. Uh, and it also reminded me a lot of uh, Chasing Amy, mm -hmm. which is probably the most obvious example. Yeah. And Chasing Amy is a movie that, at the time, it felt very uh, kind of edgy and fresh, progressive look at uh, sexual orientation, and then you look at it now and it feels so quaint and simplistic and outdated. And that's me, him, her. This movie felt like it was from a different decade. All I remember about Chasing Amy was the first 10 minutes was the funny Star Wars dialogue, and then the rest of the movie was Joey Lauren Adams screaming in a car. It's true, there's lots of screaming. Is that what you want to hear? Is it? Yeah, hold it, oh, it's true. I got it, 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 Here's the thing, though, about Chasing Amy. Uh, Are we talking about Chasing Amy or me, him, her? We're, we're talking about both because it's connected here. Okay. Uh, Chasing Amy it takes its time to really, like, I think that movie's kind of dumb now in retrospect. I liked it when I was a teenager, and maybe teenagers will like me, him, her, I don't know. But the characters in that movie are, are very, very well fleshed out before they enter, because it's about a guy that falls in love with a lesbian. And you get to understand their personalities very well, and, and so you feel something for them when the drama happens. I couldn't tell you a single thing about the, the lesbian character in this movie, other than she had a girlfriend that broke up with her. I can't tell you a single thing about her. Or the guy. Who are these people? Yeah, they weren't, they weren't very likable characters. But before we get into that, before we get into the movie, I mean, should we remind people of our, our association with our friend Max Landis? <laughs> Uh, we like Max. He's he's maybe former friend after this. I no, don't know. no, 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 no. Um, Max, Max. Uh, we we poorly reviewed his film uh, American Justice or <laughs> uh, Wet Hot American Summer. Wet Hot American Ultra. Wet Hot. Oh, American Ultra. Yes, uh, American Ultra, which which I liked. 
uh, the, uh, the only thing I didn't like was the casting, really, in American Ultra, but there's a whole ep episode about that. <laughs> Go watch that. So Max came out and uh, was our guest in the fine city of Milwaukee and uh, was on an episode of Best is the Worst where we all shared an emotional bond and experience while watching the Neil Breen film. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, after that we've, we've kept up with Max and uh, we, we communicate with him here and there. Hi, I'm Max Landis and in August of 2013 I made a movie. A real movie, not just one for YouTube. It was so exciting. I'd never directed anything before and it was one of the best experiences of my life. The movie is called Me, Him, Her. The original title was Pronouns, but we thought that'll just confuse people. Now we, we've watched his latest film, which is not his latest film. Right. Do you know the details of that as far as why? Not really. I noticed Max has uploaded a bunch of, um, of, of his own videos promoting. The issue being, they called me about four days ago and they said, uh, you, you're in charge of the marketing. I said, the movie comes out in two weeks. They said, yeah. 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 He's kind of marketing it himself, I think. There's a video with him uh, and he's talking about me, him, her, and there's a little boy, like a two-year-old eating, oh, potato, yeah, chips. eating the potato chips. Oh yeah, eating potato chips. I like that. And uh, so he's been doing sort of like viral marketing. There's one where uh, the, the screen grab is like two naked people, mm -hmm. and that's, it's like two seconds of that, and they walk off frame, and he's like, get out of the way, Wait, I'm <laughs> here to talk about my movie. Thanks, thumbnail, you can go. Come on, come on, go be in a kiss prank. Hi, I'm Max Landis. But anyway, uh, Max is Max is a great guy, and I, I think the thing is uh, is that this this kind of, this movie wasn't for us. I actually liked Victor Frankenstein. I, I liked the movie up until like uh, the last ten minutes. We got to go off, and he's got to make the Frankenstein. You can't have a Frankenstein movie without a Frankenstein in it. And then um, uh, Chronicle was good, and even American Ultra. I, I like the writing in those was more suited to my particular taste. This kind of genre doesn't really appeal to me unless it has really, really strong characters or really good. It, it felt like two things that, that weren't blending together. There's yeah. the zany Max Landis as comedy, and then there was like, oh, now take me seriously moments yeah. that was like oil and water. Yeah, and that's, you mentioned, like, because I think Max is a smart guy. Uh, if you've seen anything with it, interviews with him, him pitching ideas for things, like, he has tons of ideas. And even in, because I didn't care for Victor Frankenstein and, like, American Ultra, but even in those, and especially in Chronicle, he's good with character writing. Mm -hmm. He's good at fleshing out the characters, which is why it was so shocking in this to have no characters. Like, the, uh, the, the, the lesbian and the guy, they hook up one night, and they're just, you know, the lesbian, her girlfriend breaks up with her. So she's at a bar getting drunk, meets the guy, they get drunk together, and then they have sex in her car. And then they go their separate ways. The next time, he just happens to, uh, through coincidence, see her across the street a few days later. And so he runs up to him, and they immediately start having an argument as if they were in a relationship. Uh, and like, oh. like the kind of argument you would have if you had been seeing someone for a while. Not someone that you drunkenly slept with once and then never saw again. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, why are they, like, why do they care about each other? I, I felt no connection between anybody. Well, uh, in defense of the movie a little bit, uh, they did spend the whole night, like, it wasn't just like we got drunk and wandered into a parking lot and had sex. The premise was, was that they bonded over the whole night and they had this whole thing where uh, she, I could see you rolling your eyes internally, where she said, um, <laughs> They were in like, a bar for five seconds. No, no, no. Then they spent the whole night, almost until the sun went up, like walking around talking all night. And then she, she says like, um, you know, you, you know you really like someone when you don't have to think of things to say when you can just talk naturally with someone over the course of the whole night. Yeah. So I think they did have more of a bonding time than just sex. Sure. But anyway, you're, you're kind of, you're skirting past the general premise of the movie, which I think was, um, it was, I think it was, he was trying to do a twist on like what you were expecting from the trailers and all that, which was the premise is, 
uh, Hollywood actor guy, uh, straight and narrow, handsome Hollywood actor guy is secretly gay. Yeah. And he calls a uh, schlubby friend from Florida, old high school buddy, to come out to help him come out of the closet. And schlubby friend is usually the, the wacky comic relief, like, hey, you know, let's go get drunk. And the movie ends up being about him mm -hmm. and not the, the lead. So right. it kind of twists that direction. Well, there, there's, like you said, that's sort of subverting what you expect from this type of movie. And they kind of did that with the actor man, too. I don't remember any of these characters' names. So they're actor man, man, and lesbian. That's their character names now. But the actor man... Gabby was the girl. Okay. Uh, but actor man, uh, he's, he's scared to come out of the closet because uh, he thinks it'll ruin his career. And the, the, the subversion or the running joke throughout the movie is that everybody already knew he was gay. I'm gay. I know. Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't I tell you your sexual orientation? Oh, what about me is gay? So it's like he comes out to his parents and they're like, oh yeah, we knew. And he's like, why didn't you tell me? And he says, and they're, they're like, well, why didn't we tell you what your sexual orientation yeah. is? Everyone says that to him. And everyone says that to him. And it's, it's kind of a clever idea, but at the same time, subverting it like that takes out any sort of drama that the movie might have. Because it's like nobody cares. I mean, I mean, it becomes more about him like learning to accept himself or whatever. But, yeah. but he's not fleshed out enough where you care. Uh, yes, the, the biggest letdown uh, in terms of uh, the drama part w would have been Scott Bakula and Gina Davis reacting to his gayness mm -hmm. because his parents are set up as uh, kind of conservative, um, regular people. They're like, LA is terrible. All people do is drive around in their cars and yeah. insular, insular cars. And, um, and Scott Bakula, even though he's in the film for 30 seconds, <laughs> is the best scene in the movie. Yes. Uh, when he's like, men don't have best friends. Boys don't have best friends. Yeah. A man does not have a friend. Yeah. <laughs> he's just, I was la uh, laughing hysterically at Scott Bakula. The whole movie should have just been about Scott Bakula. But anyways, uh, so then at the end, uh, he comes out to his parents and of course they say they know. And so it's like, oh, okay. There was that tension with the parents. What was the film really supposed to be about? Yeah. Because at the end, I, I think you're right with the angle of it was more internal for him. Uh, and, and less him worrying about what the world's going to think of him. And really it was just internally. Right. The gay actor man, okay. I, I thought, was, was the most likable character. Mm. The problem with uh, a lot of the characters was that they sounded like Max Landis. That, that was something I wanted to bring up too, is that's, that's sort of the, the Kevin Smith or Woody Allen effect too, where every character just sounds like the voice of the writer. Yeah, which is why I think I gravitated towards the Hollywood actor guy, because mm. he didn't. He yeah. just sounded like a guy with a problem. And uh, the third element was the, the kind of satirical, uh, this is how Hollywood works angle, which is the scene with him in I Iron Rim Agency, <laughs> where, where you know he's got the, the people that work for him are like, you, you, you either come out of the closet as a career move late in the game or you keep it hidden. You know, that all felt really dated, all that stuff. It, it felt like, like when I say something out of the 90s, that's what it yeah, reminded me of. It felt a little dated, but then like, and then this, the, the parody of the, um, the show he's on with Haley Joel Osment, like, Hard Justice. Who also steals the movie in the 30 seconds he's in it. Even no, though the scene is overly edited. It's he, has a, he has a funny bit where he's running on his treadmill and there's cats all around him. And he's like, I gotta exercise at home because they won't let me bring my cats to the gym. I, I, that was one yeah. of the few laughs I got from the whole movie. They want to step in the ring and take a swing at the king, then bow! <laughs> so you got uh, the wacky comedy with, with a bizarre use of uh, on-screen text. Yes. In, in Sometimes it worked. There was a cute part where they were playing, I forget what song it was, where it was like a montage where they're at the carnival. Oh, yeah. And he wins the, 
the banana with the Rastafarian hat. And they're playing some song and he's trying to give the, the, to, the stuffed animal to people. Do you want this? No, mm -hmm. you know. And it felt like, uh, felt like a silent movie with inner titles. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is cute, this is clever. Um, but then there was one part where you couldn't hear what the actress said and it seemed like... Yeah. Like, yeah, it felt like, well, because she kept mumbling. It felt like it was put there as subtitles because you couldn't understand her. Yes. Yes, and I was like, what? <laughs> and then there was another part, which I was going to ask Max about, um, <laughs> when he's in the stall at the, at the gay bar, and he's like, he's like you're, the, you're the famous guy. And he goes, no, my name's Gronk Blazglaw. Yeah. And, and then the text pops up, and I was like, is that an ad lib? Yeah. Like, was that an ad lib by the actor? Did the actor fuck up? Was that, you know? And so certain times it worked, certain times it felt odd. So it's like, there's that element, there's the Hollywood satire element, and then there's this like, please take a serious drama angle. And those three parts, a triangle did not it make. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. But did you notice that the movie takes place in LA? I need you to come to LA. Welcome to Los Angeles. Uh, fuck that shit! We're in Los Angeles! Uh, yeah. It's that like, like you look at a movie like The Blues Brothers, where it's it's very much a movie about, not about Chicago, but Chicago's a big part of it, and it feels like uh, it's an important setting for the movie. With this movie, it felt like it was more in love with the idea of taking place in LA than LA really having much to do with it, other than the, the, the actor satire stuff, yeah. which fell flat anyway. The, the guy who's like, this this place they call LA is so, so weird. Yeah. Like, what, you just met a couple people. <laughs> yeah. They got streets and street lights here. It's yeah. crazy. But speaking of Blues Brothers, <laughs> um, they are. So I don't know, some of you may know this, some of you may not know this, a, a big chunk of the Blues Brothers was shot up in Milwaukee because uh, there was a part of the freeway that was under construction. And the scene called for the Bluesmobile to, to kind of hang off the edge of the thing and then it goes back and there's a backflip. <laughs> so you could see as it's driving by, you could see the, the US Bank building in the background, you could see all the, the Milwaukee landmarks. And so we're driving with, with, with Max on the exact stretch of road where they, they filmed. And I was about to say, hey, Max, you know, you, when your dad made the Blues Brothers, they, they filmed some of that here. I was about to say that. And then Max is just sitting there and he goes, so Milwaukee's like a real city, huh? <laughs> and I stop. <laughs> Damn you! I'm sure he knew that. I'm sure he knew that little fact. He probably didn't give a flying shit. Probably not. But anyways. His dad made tons of movies. I already care about this one specific element from this one movie. I know. It's just a little trivia thing. Not many things are filmed in Milwaukee. Blues I, Brothers and the Transformers sequel. Yeah, the, yes. Uh, and they filmed the exterior of, of an apartment building on oh, KK. Yeah, for Bridesmaids. For Bridesmaids. Uh, and, uh, and that's about it. Big changes coming to the lakefront now that movie crews are getting ready to shoot some scenes for the next Transformers movie. If it's anything like the other two films, Transformers 3 will put Milwaukee on the map. Enough about Milwaukee, enough about Los Angeles. Did you know the movie took place in Los Angeles? I think they mentioned it once or twice. Um, and no more Max Landis stories. Hello, Max, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, if you ever want to watch the next Neil Breen film, pass through with us. I, I'm, I think we're waiting for you for that one. When does it come out? I think it's out. I don't what? know. Yeah! Come on, man! Why is it always like this with you, Corey? The film ends in an epic sword fight. Yes. What, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Jay, did, was there anything you liked about me, him, her? Uh, I, I liked Scott Bakula. It, it tries to subvert a lot of tropes of like romantic comedies, but it doesn't in a way that deflates any sort of investment in the movie. Like I liked the idea that the the, the lesbian character's ex-girlfriend 
Like, whenever there's an ex in these type of movies, they're always, like, such a horrible asshole or such a horrible bitch that you wonder, like, why was the person even with them? Mm -hmm. And they take that to a, a ridiculously over-the-top degree in this, which I thought was funny in concept. But again, it's at odds with the more dramatic elements of the movie. Oh, and I was curious. Uh, uh, certain things felt inside jokey, too, which is not a good thing to do. I mean, we can do it. Like with like our film, <laughs> because no one's gonna see it. Um, but what felt inside jokey? Uh, well, the banana with the Rastafarian hat. Because I don't know if you watched past the credits. Oh yeah, it keeps showing the, up. This thing, where I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, like me as a, just a person, I'm like, is that a joke? Like what what happens when you get one of those big dumb stuffed animals at a at a carnival, like what do you do with it? Like yeah. that's a whole comedy bit in itself. Oh, I won this giant stuff, oh fuck, it's constantly inconveniencing us. Yeah. That's a whole other comedy bit. But um, there's that, and then a little thing I picked up on was at the bar. There's ADR of a guy in the background, and he's like, he's like, no, a rum and coke. He's like, oh yeah. Do, do you put Jägermeister in a rum and coke? He's like, that's our policy. I was like, what? And, and then, then it comes up again later. Yeah, and I'm so I'm like, is that is that is that Max's drink like rum and coke with a splash of a Jaeger in it or something like that? I don't, no, no, no. Maybe that's an L.A. thing. Us dumb uh, Midwesterners wouldn't understand. A flyover moo cows. Flyover moo cows don't understand the 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 L.A. bar jokes in this film. I didn't mind the concept of. The, the guy from Florida falling in love with the lesbian Gabby. I mean, other than it was done in Chasing Amy. Sure. But uh, I just, I, I, I couldn't understand what she was saying. I needed to turn my hearing aid up. <laughs> but case in point, uh, this is a film for people born in the 90s who take Adderall. <laughs> and not for grandpas like me. <laughs> I guess. You're just like stomp, only you should be called stop. <laughs>